Immigration Minister Fred Mitchell breaks down the new student immigration policy. A local junior high school closed after a scabies outbreak. This as smoke from the dump forces the closure of another school. Plus, government signs a multi-million dollar contract to repair North Andrus roads. We've got those stories and more coming up tonight. I'm Dana Smith and NV12 starts right now. Copy news tonight, the Foreign Affairs and Immigration Minister is today giving clarification on government's new immigration policy that will require all non-Bahamian students to have a permit by September. Fred Mitchell says there are simply too many within the public arena spreading inaccurate information. Our Kyle Joaquin sat down with the minister today for a clear breakdown of what this policy really means and what would happen to those who don't abide by it. Foreign Affairs and Immigration Minister Fred Mitchell says there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding the government's immigration policy set to take effect this September. He said for starters, it's not new, but just the government enforcing a policy that's been around for years. Mitchell said it's disappointing to hear some of the comments coming from educated men whom he said only appear to be spreading misleading and inaccurate information about the policy. Queen's Counsel Fred Smith and former Deputy Prime Minister Brent Simonet have already voiced their concerns on the matter. Some believe it goes against the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, which specifies the right to education, regardless of ethnicity, gender, religion, and other statuses. However, Mitchell dubbed those statements that the policy goes against international agreements and treaties as mere nonsense. And any claim that uh, the policy is ultra-virus, our treaty obligations, is spurious and false, and they should stop spreading such nonsense around and trying to frighten people with nonsense. The Department of Immigration's ability to enforce the policy was also questioned by the former Deputy Prime Minister. However, Mitchell said he's confident there shouldn't be a problem with the processing of these permits. This policy, according to Mitchell, was created to help those who require a belonger's permit. That permit is needed for those born in the Bahamas who have not yet reached the age of 18 and have no status. Problem is that the framers of the Constitution provided no um, immigration status for people in that position. So these people live here without any status. And some of them can't open a bank account, can't get a driver's license, and certainly can't get a job. So this is designed to assist that category of persons. As for Simonette's statement that if the government had to implement this policy, that 2016 would have been better, Mitchell said he pretty much expected that and added that for matters of such sensitivity as this, there is never a perfect time. So what happens to children whose parents are here illegally, but according to the UN's Convention on the Rights of the Child, should still be able to attend school? Anyone who is a non-national should have a permit to reside here. If your parents are here illegally, they'll be deported, and you'll be deported with them. But if you present yourself to the school system, there is it is administratively possible for the Director of Immigration to issue a permit which coincides with the uh, time that your parents are here. So when your parents, as long as your parents are here and not removed from the country, then it is possible for the director to grant a permit. But once your parents are removed, you have to go with your parents. The question now remains, what will happen come September if a non-Bahamian student doesn't have a permit? Would he or she still be allowed inside the school? Well, according to Mitchell, that decision will be made on a case-by-case -case basis by education officials. Mitchell said at this point he can only speculate based on cases in the past. That on a case-by-case -case basis, you determine who is a person who's fit and proper to come into your school. And that's for them. Uh, the Ministry of Education has been dealing with it all along. They know what the rules are. Uh, and there's been no dramatic change in any rule. And there's the increase in penalties, which Mitchell said should soon make its way through cabinet. If passed in parliament, fines will go up to $10,000 for non-compliance in addition to three years imprisonment. Reporting for NB12, I'm Kyle Joaquin.
It has been exactly one year since Bamboo Town MP Wernward Wells gave notice in the House of Assembly that government would establish a select committee to investigate the 2011 BTC sale. However, that committee still hasn't been formed. Wells is now suggesting the Christie administration may no longer have the desire to dredge up the past and has shifted its focus to the liberalization of the telecommunications sector. Bonnie Toot has the details. February 5, 2014, Bamboo Town MP Renward Wells gives notice that a select committee to be established by government should investigate, examine, and inquire into the surrounding circumstances and facts relating to the privatization of BTC. Just nine days later, on February 14th, Wells admits it is unclear when that select committee would be established. Now fast forward to March 24, 2014. Wells asserts in Parliament that the need for a BTC probe into the egregious deal is more urgent than ever. Exactly one year after the Bamboo Town MP gave notice, there has been no mention of a BTC probe. So what happened? I think the thinking now is that we're going to move in the direction of privatizing, um, uh, well, liberalizing the industry. And as a result of that, I don't know if there's still the desire to go and sort of dredge up the past somewhat. Folks would argue whether it's financially uh, we, sh we should spend our time looking into that or whether we should be moving forward more with liberalizing the sector. However, Wells says he believes government can chew gum and walk at the same time, asserting the details of the sale of 51 percent of BTC shares to CWC should be explored. I did call for a select committee and I do think that, um, you know, the details of B the BTC deal um, ought, to be, ought to be made clear, you know, uh, more and more. I have sort of mulled over it, uh, but I believe we could chew gum and walk at the same, at the same time. So perhaps we ought to be doing both. The committee appointed by Prime Minister Perry Christie to negotiate the reacquisition of 2% of BTC pushed for the establishment of a committee as well. Businessman Franklin Wilson, who headed the negotiating team set last year, government netted less than $100 million for selling 51% of BTC to CWC in 2011. The sale price was $210 million. The government at this point in time, and the Prime Minister would have to speak to that, is pleased with what he has gotten out of BTC. Majority economic, and I will use the Prime Minister's word, the majority economic control of BTC. Um, and you know, that is a point that folks can argue back and forth. Uh, but again, I think that the government has taken the decision to move forward on the liberalization side um, as quickly as possible. It's an opportunity to bring money into the public treasury and to give the Bahamian people service. Wells says he believes the Christie administration can learn from the past as it moves to liberalize the telecommunications sector. He called for licenses to be issued to four mobile service providers. The Prime Minister has laid out the idea that what is going to happen is they may auction off the next license to the other individual who may be entering the market. I think I personally believe that the Bahamian's telecommunications market can handle anywhere from three to four pro providers. And I believe that the sooner we get that kind of competition going in the country, it's better for all of us. Former Prime Minister Hubert Ingram said in 2012 he would welcome any probe into the BTC deal. Reporting for NB12, I'm Vonig Toot. T.A. Thompson Junior High School will be closed tomorrow due to a confirmed case of scabies at the school. Principal Dwayne Higgins confirmed to NB12 today that students were tested and parents were notified of the outbreak, which has resulted in the school being closed until Monday. Once we identified that particular case, um, the director would have um, gotten things um, moving. We would have um, had a staff briefing yesterday to update the staff in terms of what's going on. Um, and today um, we agreed to um, have the entire school tested in terms of checked um, by the nurses. They came in um, this afternoon and they were able to get through the entire um, student body, those who were present. Scabies is a highly infectious skin disease caused by the infestation of an itch mite. The disease causes severe and relentless itching and is mostly caused by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. This is the second school within a week to have at least one confirmed case of scabies. The D.W. Davis High School experienced a closure as well due to the outbreak. Higgins says while the students are out, the school will undergo an extensive cleaning. This is the first time in any school that I've been in New Providence where we have dealt with um, this type of a thing. 
we've dealt with other issues. But when you have schools um, that where students come predominantly from inner city areas, you're going to find that whatever's happening in the inner city is going to come to school because um, scabies in particular, it's not something that's at school. It's actually at home that the children bring to school. Bahamas Union of Teachers shop steward Willamay Pratt says she doesn't think students contracted the disease at school but at home. I can't say it happened here at the school or where, but um, you know, things happen even at home. Mm -hmm. And um, there was one child who actually said that she had an itch. I don't know where, but because she wasn't in my class. And that's where we got the idea from to really um, test, the test the students to go through. For days, students at the Meridian School have not been allowed on campus because of smoke from the fire at the city dump. Today, the entire student body was relocated to the New Providence Community Center. School Director Lisa McCartney says she is disappointed they can't use the facility and she's hoping more places become available to them to utilize until they are able to return to their campus. Simone Davis reports. Students and teachers of the Meridian School were forced to relocate today after three days of the school being shut down due to the thick smoke coming from the city dump, especially when it rains. McCartney says she is exhausting all options possible to ensure that this does not hinder the students' education, but more importantly, that they remain healthy. We have an amazing, we have a very, very unique and amazing community. Our parents, while it is frustrating, Everybody here, our goal is the health and safety of our children. Yes, we do want, we don't want to interrupt our educational process, but we do not want to develop sick lungs as well. So parents are very understanding. They're frustrated. I think their anger is more aimed at the powers that be that have ignored this situation for goodness knows how long and, and have not accepted responsibility. And I think that's the most frustrating thing. It's very difficult to get any answers. And um, that, that is the most frustrating and I find it quite insulting as well. She noted that during the three days that school was shut down, parents were forced to leave their children at home because there was nowhere else they could have school. However, she said they were lucky to be able to rent the NPCC for the day, but she is unsure what will happen for the days that follow. We are looking at um, temporary um, venues to relocate in the event that we have smoke days. Um, and that's what's happened today. New Providence Community Center has graciously offered us their space. Um, the challenge that I'm having is that it's very difficult to uproot and relocate 300 children and 40 staff members. Um, so that's a significant challenge of ours um, right at the moment. McCartney said fires at the dump have been an issue for the school for the past four years. And while she is pleased with the help they are getting from Renew Bahamas, she still thinks more could be done. We've had many school closures over the past three weeks. Um, more importantly, over the past four years, um, we've experienced school closures. And um, we're, it's, it's starting to significantly impact our school. I'm a doer, and I believe that a part of the beauty of life is finding solutions to life's challenges. And um, so uh, it's a tough time, but you know, I've accepted the responsibility of educating these children. I've accepted parents' money. So it is my responsibility to find alter alternate arrangements for the children while this, or, you know, while this continues. Some of the students also express their frustrations with not being able to go to school on their own campus. For one, I feel really disappointed for the people who live really close to it, um, to the dump and all that smoke, like Miss Lisa. Her house is so close to it. So I feel bad because, um, and then also I feel really bad because a lot of kids in our school sadly have asthma. I think that we should be aware of what we're doing because we're not only affecting the environment uh, ourselves, but we're also affecting our environment. And it's not really good for the air because when it rains, then the acid will come polluted too. So when little kids start to like drink the rain or, you know, little kids do that and they're actually um, drinking little fumes with acid that the clouds build up and I don't think that's okay. One student offered advice to Bahamians on how to avoid massive fires. I guess people can start recycling and some people are saying that people should move the dump somewhere, but that's a lot of money, so it won't <laughs> really happen until a long time. But yeah, people can start recycling and have 
different places in the Bahamas for recycling. Renew Bahamas officials said there were two more fires at the landfill before they completely got rid of the smoke and flames of the January 17th blaze. Officials said they are working diligently to contain these fires and the smoke with little assistance from the government. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis.